Have you ever had that feeling that you're in the wrong place, that you're outside of your element, that you're somehow a square in a round hole, or vice versa, and you just don't belong. Have you ever had that? Well, I did, and it was one of the best things that ever happened to me, and it taught me a lot about how to succeed. It taught me a lot about the art of learning, and it was absolutely essential to my success, and we're going to talk about that today while we talk about the art of learning, which is very magical when it appears with the uh, green screen behind us here. But it's an excellent, excellent book, and I am excited to share with you some of the secrets inside. Now, if you can hear me loud and clear, let me know in the chat that you are joining us. Hit the thumbs up, and Arkham Meat is in the house. I love that. <laughs> what a great what a great screen name. Arkham Meat. Sean Tate is with us in, from New Jersey. Excellent. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. If you're watching the replay, get involved in the discussion below, and hit that thumbs up. Never too late to let those robots know that humans are here and joining us. Anyway, this is a really, really cool book, and it has a lot of secrets of learning from Josh Whiteskin, and I picked apart some things that I think are really, really powerful, and it reminded me of fortune and chance and just being willing to be in the wrong place really, really helped me in my scholarly career in terms of learning faster and being able to see the end game in a way that allowed me to sort of reverse engineer, so to speak, a lot of the path to getting great grades in university and then getting a PhD. And so what was that being in the wrong place at the right time or however you want to word that? Well, at York University in the Ross building, there was at that time on the seventh floor, what we called the seventh floor grad lounge. And um, you were supposed to only be in there if you were a grad student, so to speak. And you know, faculty would hang out there as well. And I didn't ask really for permission or anything like that. I just heard that there were great conversations going on there all the time. And so that's where I wanted to be. And it took a little bit of guts because the people were older. And again, it was a lot of faculty hanging out in the grad lounge. And it's where they would meet their students that they were supervising for the PhD and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, some of us at that time were not old enough technically to be in a place that was serving alcohol. So we would get ID'd and all that sort of stuff. And um, it, was, it was very interesting. But the thing was, is you would feel uncomfortable because there were people who were way over your head. They're talking uh, about terminology and concepts and topics that just, you know, you, you couldn't even begin to get a, a hold of because you'd never heard some of those terms speaking in multiple languages, etc., etc. But it was really, really cool because you got an advanced preview of what exams were like in grad school, even if you were just in your BA, like I was when I first started to hang out there. So it was very, very important. And that's one of the main tips that comes from this book is get outside of your ele element. So we're going to go through some of my main observations from the book and want to just start with that story. And what's really neat about it too is that when you're outside of your element, you gather allies that you wouldn't have otherwise. So for example, when I first walked into the first meeting of my graduate program for the PhD in humanities, I instantly saw the person, Jamie Scott, who became my doctoral supervisor. And we knew each other for many, many years because of hanging out in the grad lounge. And for some many reasons, he was one of the reasons I was there in the first place. But I d didn't really know that he was part of the humanities program, and I never could have anticipated that he would be part of the humanities program. So that was very, very interesting. And so there's allies already there, ready to help out, to connect. And, you know, we just it was just made it a much more familiar territory because I had learned already so much from him. And uh, that's another sort of cool thing about being outside of your element. Crone Woman Walking is in the house. She's quitting her second job to devote more time to self-education. That's very uh, good to hear. And thank you for your conversation recently about the Gary Weber texts. Really appreciate that. That's on the community tab. For those of you who don't know about the community tab, I think you're really missing out because we have a lot of fun over there chatting about various things. Uh, and that's on YouTube, either in your device or on the desktop uh, on my channel. You click 
the community and you can get involved. Speaking of community, thank you to everybody who shared this interview around. Thinking about the art of learning, this is all about chess matches and martial art matches and so forth, but how that the lessons from becoming a chess master and a master of martial arts apply to just learning anything. And uh, I was really, really pleased to see 130 shares on this uh, episode with Braden Adams. And we normally, I was telling Braden, I was like, you know, we normally don't see that much interest in our uh, memory competition stuff. And so, yeah, uh, not to <laughs> not to deflate the value of being on the show, but, you know, this was a, a very pleasant surprise. So thank you to everybody who did that. And this is connected to another tip from here that I think you'll find very, very powerful and useful in your learning journey, um, which uh, is has to do with caring about results, even if you have to be detached from them. And it's a, it's a paradox, but it's something very, very important. So I really care that when my guests are on that they get exposure, and this is really amazing. So I'm very grateful for everybody who helped out. And I uh, hope that if you haven't checked it out yet, you will and um, make sure that you share it around because that is one of the things that really helps this uh, community grow and also helps Braden's community grow because he has uh, some great initiatives in the memory competition world that is going on and you can learn a lot from competition as uh, you learn from the art of learning. So shared that link to the interview for you in the the um, chat here so please bookmark it for later and do share it around comment etc and i think you're going to learn a lot from uh brayden and his ideas and his passion and uh in general i into an art and a craft and a science and before we get started thank you to everybody who is always asking me about the release of my next book we are getting into the pre uh, mode of some announcements and so forth. So if you would like to uh, have some advance notice before anybody else, please be part of the street team for the next book. I will give you a hint now. BM has to do with the title of the book, but the M is not memory. And uh, <laughs> even though the book does have to do with memory, of course, and we appreciate everybody who gets involved in the launch of this book because it has the biggest possible mission for all people, and we are going to need your help to get it into hands around the world so that people can benefit from the project of what memory used to do for people, uh, which goes far, far beyond learning and leads to long-lasting mental peace and clarity and release from suffering at the end of the day. And you can still learn really fast with it. So that's the project. Look forward to having your support behind it. So go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM or click that link if it's clickable on your screen there. Just type it in and uh, get ready for the first reveal with a little video for you there. And Michael is here. Good to see you, Michael. Says, love the masterclass and need to get back to my memory palaces. Well, please do. And if you haven't already, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM for a little preview of the memory palace that you see on the screen there, which is the core of the next book. And I think, I don't know for sure, but I think it's very, very unique in the realm of memory training. I don't think there's anything that's been done like this before in this depth, uh, but could be wrong. In any case, we need your help, your support behind its launch, and it's going to help you anyway. And, you know, back to Crone Woman Walking, this answers a lot of the questions that we were talking about uh, on the community tab together about the role of memory and memorizing particular information to essentially solve mental issues that relate to pain and suffering and so forth and learning in the sense of the art of learning because so much of uh, the pain and suffering that we have comes from not approaching learning in the most optimal way. So Michael says, I'll definitely buy the book. Can't wait. Thank, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. And looking forward to getting it to you. Just so you know, it's really super complicated. I've never done anything like this kind of launch of anything. So it's all sort of learning to me. Part of the learning is being really, really patient 
And it's good timing that I read this book because this book is about being patient and really going through the motions that need to be gone through in order for certain things to happen because we want this in airports. We want it in bookstores around the world, etc. I could go the way that I've done it before and I've done 12 books that hit bestseller status on Amazon before and I'm pretty sure I could do it again. But we want to go much, much bigger than just Amazon because that is a, uh, a mountain I've climbed many times before. So thank you uh, for getting that. Uh, Michael, when it's ready, it's not available for pre-order yet, but it will be as soon as possible. Uh, there's still some steps to go. And if you're in interested in publishing, perhaps we can one day <laughs> have a chat about what all those steps are. But rest assured, I interned for Bloomsbury when I lived in New York. And so I have a bit of a sense of what all these steps are. There's a reason why I've avoided all those official steps before, because they're too slow. They're too this, that, and the other thing. But we must remove our uh, ideas about the world. And you may already notice that when you take away what your ego wants, then things are just fine. But it's very rigorous and robust and detailed. And so we're doing it step by step. And if you want the first reveal, and you want to always consistently have the reveals ahead of everybody else, make sure you go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash VM. Reclaiming Life is in the house, says hello to everyone. It feels like it's been a long time since I caught a live stream. So good to see you all again. Yes, thank you, William. Thanks for being here. I have uh, had some injuries and uh, also been super busy with preparing this new book and haven't been able to live stream as much as I would like and etc. But good to see you. Thank you for being here. Always great. And... Um, as you know, there's also been some, uh, <laughs> some, some uh, scares on the, on the waves of the world lately that we had to at least have due diligence around. All right. So what is the first tip around the art of learning? Well, this one's really, really important. It's the one that holds so many people back. And that is they get perfectionistic about things around which there is no perfect. And so the number one tip that you've got to avoid is perfectionism. It doesn't, it's not possible. Perfectionists aren't even good at being perfect. And so one of the amazing things, if you read The Art of Learning, that you'll come across, especially in the early pages, are portraits of just how destructive it is to the individual psyche when people get caught up in perfectionism. They become very tribal. They destroy their own happiness and it never leads to anywhere because the minute that you're out of the public view they forget you right <laughs> so you know you did it all for for what uh, a few minutes of glory perhaps or a few minutes of epic shame because you were destroyed in a competition no you've got to be in it for the game itself and when you're a student you've got to be in it for the study itself for the learning itself because you don't know what the outcome is going to be you know when I was at York University, they went on strike so many times, I can't even count them on two hands. And it was disappointing every time, and you never could anticipate when it was going to happen. But because I was in it for the learning, unlike a lot of other people that were like, eh, now this, blah, 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 and then they just didn't know what to do with themselves, or they went and got extra jobs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I was like, hell yeah, now I can spend more time <laughs> learning. And I went to the library and I studied anyway, uh, because I, would, I was in love with the game, right? So it's really, really important to avoid perfectionism. You'll have a lot uh, more adventure. Doesn't that seem fair? If you would just not make it perfect, just take it as it is, that you will um, have a much better journey. All right. Now, the next major tip is to remove inner conflict. And so there's a lot of inner conflicts that people have. And this uh, book is a great study of what many of those are including the author's own, Joshua Waitzkin, and you know some of the inner conflicts that I had in university that were really destructive were just imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome can look like something, uh, for example, the opening story that I told about being in the grad lounge, not belonging, too young to be hanging around with professors, etc., and way over my head, all the terminology that they were using and so forth. But I was legal uh, age to be to be in there, and, uh, at least in Canada. And it's just that your mind saying things like that, right? Uh, it's very, very uh, important to just get rid of inner conflicts. And imposter syndrome is a big one that a lot of people have, but there may be other ones. Uh, scarcity, for example. So many people have scarcity around things for which they have 
no real logical reason to suffer scarcity from. Um, so you might want to look into that in your life, scarcity of time, scarcity of resources. And, and sometimes there is real limits and lack in your life, but you can find other ways. And usually what you need is nearer than you think. So if you can't get the books, can you go to the library? If the library doesn't have what you need, can you get an interlibrary loan? If that doesn't work, can you go to ABE Books or something like this? Can you can you get it for a penny on Amazon, which is often the case? You, like, can you get a previous edition? If you can't get the 2019 edition, can you get the 2017 edition and just deal with it anyway? Yes, it'll be missing this, that, or the other thing. But if you just have the scarcity mindset, this conflict inside of you can blind you to alternative resources that are absolutely available to you at any time. So keep that in mind. Anyway, there's lots and lots of inner conflicts and perhaps you uh, will either now or on the replay have some to share in the discussion. Maricela is in the house. Good to see you, Maricela. It's been a while. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, so another learning tip after avoiding perfectionism and removing inner conflict is to embrace complexity. So one of the things that I find so tedious in the world is this idea that things shouldn't be hard work and work harder or work smarter, not harder, et cetera, et cetera. Smarter, in my view, is an acronym which would stand for something like serious, mature, um, a serious, mature, absolutely ready to embrace reality. Is that all the letters? S yeah, I think so. <laughs> Smart, mature, absolutely ready to embrace reality. That's what we need to do, right? Because reality is complex. And with all appreciation to the people who either note that some of these videos I do are very long or complain, heaven forbid, that uh, anybody would complain about anything that was given to them freely. But uh, to, to, with all due respect to those who you know think that long form content is somehow too long and too complicated and all this sort of stuff, let's let's grow up there's complexity in the world and your ability to succeed is your ability to deal with complexity and you don't necessarily have to eat the elephant all in one bite but you do need to bite <laughs> elephants and you need to swallow entire elephants whole if you want to get anywhere in life and there's different ways to do it but you've got to just simply accept that some things are complex and this is very, very important. And it's a major tip that comes from this book. And I hope that all people who are able to get this will get this is that the results are not tied and they're not tied in any way to your intelligence. None, not whatsoever. Intelligence is a little bit of a myth. IQ is a myth. It's not necessary to be particularly intelligent. I'll, I'll never forget being a, a university student at, um, at York University, I used to work at Para Paints in a giant warehouse, stacking paints uh, onto pallets and putting them in the back of trucks after we wrapped them all up. And I'd be discovering some whiz-bang, razzmatazz intellectual theory. And we'd be in the lunchroom and I'd be talking to one of these older gentlemen who was a union guy, worked there for 30 years, got the gold watch from the company, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be explaining some amazing oh, wow, the most incredibly complex theory that I ever heard in my life, the centrality of the center as such, according to the peripheral <laughs> veracity of this, that, and the other thing. And, and, and he, the, I remember one guy in particular saying, yeah, I saw that last week on an episode of The Simpsons. And he went and just explained how The Simpsons, um, you know, gave this perfect example of how all that works. And it was a great lesson because he got it immediately and he's just a guy who's you know working for his retirement got the gold watch going to be out of there real soon and he knew this he understood it immediately and he wasn't paying eighteen hundred dollars for the course that i was <laughs> in order to figure it out and he didn't have to read these convoluted texts that were poorly translated into english uh like i did from photocopied uh, text uh, readers that, you know, cost an inordinate amount of money. Anyway, experience shows that results are not tied to intelligence. What they're tied to is something else. And part of that is persistence. Part of that is frequency of showing up to study. 
And part of it is making sure that you're actually just showing up to study relevant information in a spirit of experimentation and to do so in a way that is entertaining to yourself, even if complexity can be challenging and sometimes, heaven forbid, boring. Gasp, this is boring. Oh no. <laughs> well, sometimes things are, right? But if you have the tools to make it interesting and exciting to yourself, then it's amazing what can happen for you. And then you get more intelligent, you get smarter in that acronymistic way that we just talked about. So one of the things that comes out of the art of learning that I really appreciate is um, the reference to Dweck. Uh, Carol Dweck, I think is her name. Um, and there's a, a discussion there about entity learners versus incremental learners. And the idea there is that some people from a young age, they hold in their minds a image of an outcome. And that entity that they build in their mind is of the perfect learner or the, the perfect professional or whatever it is. They just create a false god, essentially. And then they think, well, I'm not smart enough to do that, or I'm not disciplined enough to do that, or I'm not this enough to do that, I'm not that enough to do that. And it's absolutely destructive because you obviously cannot become an ideal. It's an ideal precisely because it can't be realized, right? That's what ideals are, things that cannot be realized. And there is a simple way to become the other kind of learner, which is an incremental learner who says, I can break this down, I can find strategies and tools to deal with the uh, mass of information, to make my way through the chaos, through the weeds of all of this super difficult stuff, and I will do it incrementally. I will chew that elephant or bite the elephant one bite at a time, right? And so that's part of what we need to all do and remind ourselves of all the time. I have to do it with the complexity that I'm dealing with with my next book, and you have to do it with whatever is complex in your life. Maybe in your work you have a manager who helps make everything incremental, Maybe it's a bad manager. Maybe it's a good manager. I don't know. But at the end of the day, if you create false gods that are impossible to uh, actually realize, then you're going to be in trouble. And that's what the entity learner is like. They lock themselves out of the goal because they've created an ideal that actually doesn't exist and isn't possible. Whereas the incremental learner breaks it down, figures out the way, deals with it, and shows up consistently and persistently in order to do it. David is in the house in Gainesville, Florida, enjoying the live stream. Thanks for being here, David. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and how things are going for you. Now, how do you become an incremental learner? Well, one of the major tips in this book is put yourself on the line, right? And this can be very, very challenging. And back to my story of being in the grad lounge when I didn't feel like I belonged there, that's putting yourself on the line, going and introducing yourself to people. I remember just introducing myself to people at the table and saying, hey, did I just hear you mention constructio pregnans? What is that, <laughs> right, uh, as an example? And then that person would look up and they'd be a little bit startled. They'd be with, the professor would be with their grad student or the grad student would be with another grad student or whatever it is. And, you know, oh, well, that's that's Latin for pregnant with meaning, and uh, or it's um, whatever. I think it's actually Latin and, and Greek put together. Um, but whatever the whole thing is, is you just insert yourself into the thing, putting yourself on the line with curiosity or whatever, and you allow yourself to benefit from what happens after you do that. But if you never put yourself on the line, you never learn. Uh, I remember many, many times living in Germany, just starting to talk to people. Just the other day, someone uh, in the, uh, one of the Magnetic Mary Method students came and, you know, we were in the, uh, in a cafe and I just noticed the people who were Asian there and I just spoke some Chinese to them and I didn't even know if they were Chinese or not. And uh, it turned out they were Japanese. So we uh, we switched and tried a little Japanese, <laughs> you know, and you just put yourself on the line. So it's not a big deal, but you never learn. I would never even know that they were Japanese and not Chinese unless that I asked and they maybe would have said they were Korean, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to find out when you put yourself on the line that there's absolutely so much to learn. Same thing when I went to a memory competition. I had no idea really what I was going to learn, but if I hadn't had the courage to sit there and, uh, you know, 
take the risk of looking like a moron, I never would have learned so much. Dave Farrell would have never taught me what he taught me, which has been a gift ever since. And I don't think he would ever share those kinds of uh, details with somebody who he hadn't seen with his own eyes actually show up and give it the good old college try, as, as we say. And even when I haven't performed that well in memory demonstrations, that was a competition, not really a demonstration, but it's still a demonstration. Even when I have been really super tired and done a demonstration and made a mistake or two, I have so much to learn from these little slips, these little mistakes that happen, and they will happen. And one of the things I love about this book is that, yes, there's some huge triumphs, but actually it's more about the failures and what was learned from the failures about showing up. So you're going to be absolutely delighted by what happens when you put yourself on the line and uh, you'll probably laugh your head off at uh, your own ego and how it got in the way of you showing up and just being there to do stuff in order to learn. And I think language learners struggle with this uh, the most because it, it is admittedly a challenge to show up and start to speak a language. But you've got to do it. You've got to do it. Otherwise, you will be locked out of learning so much. So it's a huge tip from the art of learning is just put yourself on the line. And just realize that most people will forget your mistakes within two to five seconds. So the only thing is in your head, right? Miguel is in the house. Good to see you, Miguel. Thank you for being with us. Good to see you here. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. If you are watching the replay, get involved in the discussion below and also hit that thumbs up. All right. So that's a huge tip. Put yourself on the line. I've many, many, many times learned so much from that. Now, the thing is, even though, you know, for example, when you speak a language and you might make a mistake and, and you might have these feelings and so forth, uh, you don't want to be so detached from the mistakes that you make that you, that you don't care about the results. You do want to care about the results. And if you, and this is a huge tip from the book, is that you, um, you need to care about the results, but you need to be totally detached at the same time. So how can you actually have that both going on? How can you be detached from the results and care about them at the same time? Well, you just simply learn how to let go of the outcome. And then when you have the outcome, whether it's good or bad, you just analyze, hey, what happened there? And you give it some words, some description. And if you do have some sort of attachment and emotional response, you also give them words and, you know, you just be open and discussed about it. So a perfect case is, you know, again, I th thanks to everybody who shared this around 130 shares on this interview. Wonderful. I'd love to see that doubled. Right. And I do care about uh, those things. It, we sometimes in the internet world call it vanity metrics. And, you know, it, it, it is kind of a thing. Oh, look at this. Pat me on the back. Got 130 shares. Right. Well, uh, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter that much because it's not necessarily the key driver of any of the actual results that make this teaching possible. But by the same token, I really do care about it because it is a great sign and symbol and a driver at some level of what makes this teaching possible. So, you know, can't get hung up on it, can't get held back if it got zero, right? Can't let it rock the ship and destroy the journey. But we also want to be able to look at it and say, wow, that's amazing. What went right there? What was it about this? And um, one of the things I talked about earlier was having allies. So I asked some of my allies in the world of doing internet-y stuff, and they said, well, it's probably a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and how about that, and so forth. And I learned a lot as a result of just analyzing it one way or the other. And in my little world of internet friends, uh, we often talk about these things and we figure things out. And uh, Joseph says, he's here from Georgia. Good to see you, Joseph. Wonderful, wonderful. And you say, preaching the gospel of memory. That's why. <laughs> indeed, indeed. As I uh, have once told Reclaiming Life, I don't know if he's still with us. <laughs> if I'm in the house, it is the church of memory. <laughs> anyway, um, the point is, no matter what you're doing, you've got to, you know, be involved, but also be detached at the same time. And it is a bit of a paradox, I'll admit. Same thing with this book. And if you haven't yet gotten a part, gotten joined up as the street team, if you're interested, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM 
I'll put that in the chat for you because we want to knock this book out of the park and I am learning a whole different level of what it takes to publish uh, a book that reaches a much, much bigger audience than the ones that I've done before. And I've got to both care about the outcome and be detached from it because it doesn't uh, do any good to get emotionally involved uh, one way or the other because you won't learn nearly as much. And that's the key point. So there's no need for you to diminish your results by getting emotionally involved in what's going on there. And there's no need for you to miss the lessons by getting your ego, you know, too chuffed uh, when, you, when things go right, because you'll miss out on learning. And this is a key lesson here. And that's so much of what my next book is about, is how do you get detached from the outcome? How do you let it go? So in the new book, we're talking about how free will operates when it comes to memory, talking about a lot of things that people may not know about the memory tradition and how that they can use that to their benefit in order to experience more mental clarity, freedom from the monkey mind chatter and so forth. And very, very uh, much something that I hope will take this project of the Magnetic Mary Method to where the ancients used to keep memory and you as well. All right. So thank you in advance for all your interest. Well, thank you for all your interest so far. People keep asking me, when's the new book coming out? And I still don't know the exact date, but we are ready to start with revealing different elements of it. And um, thank you in advance for your support. All right. So what's the next tip from the art of learning? Well, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning with my story of the grad lounge, which is a great memory palace, by the way, you want to focus on the end game. And so as uh, Josh Waitzkin points out a lot in this book, one of the key problems in chess is that a lot of new players are taught to focus on openings. And yes, I mean, some understanding of openings makes a big difference, but it's the end game, middle game stuff that really makes the big difference because there's a lot of microscopic details involved. And, you know, a person may not be interested in chess whatsoever, but I still recommend that you read this book because it's not really about chess. It's about learning and everything has an end game. It's very, very important to understand that end games are not exclusive to chess. Everything has an end game and including your exams. If you're a student or if you're learning a language, there is a kind of end game there as well, which in that case would be something like when you plateau. One of the things that a lot of people a lot of people um, don't understand is that we all plateau and we often plateau quicker than we would like. So when you take up a new learning project, you plateau and then you, you fall off, partly because you're just discouraged by the plateau. And one of the things we need to do is have an understanding that that's coming so that we can use the challenge frustration curve to make sure that we keep moving forward, keep growing. Um, so if we don't know about that, then you'll, you're unconscious or subconscious will send you a signal that essentially removes you from the game. So we need to learn about the end game of everything. In the case of the grad lounge story I was sharing at the beginning, by hanging out with professors who were always talking about how that they were working with grad students, prepare, helping their students prepare for their field exams, prepare for their dissertation, etc. I had this massive preview of how that was all going to go. So in my BA, I was already preparing for it. I already was studying in my BA the end game. I knew a lot about the academic industry, reading the Chronicle of Higher Education as a, a student in, in the BA program. Uh, that was very, very helpful. And we've talked a lot on previous live streams and other videos about how that any student can take on that attitude and really know a lot about what's going to be expected of them on exams far in advance. So I highly recommend that you do that. Reclaiming Life says in the chat, chat, you discuss how free will operates in the upcoming book. I remember you explaining why you think free will doesn't exist. Yes, well, the thing is, is that there's a difference between free will and there's acts of will. So we need to go into this. Also, there's um, been some rather dramatic claims that the research that has been used to talk about free will not existing has been quote unquote 
debunked. So this was in the Atlantic not that long ago that uh, a lot of the scientific research where they do brain scans that show that your unconscious mind or your subconscious mind has already made decisions in advance, or sorry, your, your brain really, your muscles have made these decisions before that your unconscious mind or your conscious mind is even aware of it. And then they say that this has all been debunked. Now, that is part of the free will discussion. And I really don't have a dog in the game of whether it's been debunked or not, but I don't think that we, I don't think adults use that term debunked in scientific uh, matters. It, it may be that new evidence challenges those earlier uh, findings, but that's never what the real free will discussion was ever about. Free will has to do with the difference between choice and selection, and we go into this in the book as it pertains to memory and learning. So yes, there's a chapter on it. I've thought of removing that chapter, but it seems essential to me because we also talk about death anxiety as a uh, issue. So uh, we need to cover free will because the whole fantasy that you have any is a trigger of death anxiety, at least as I see it. And if we can get out of death anxiety in our lives, we will be a much more prepared human being for living a much higher life, as the title of the book will uh, show. And of course, if you would like to know the title before anybody else, make sure you're part of the street team at the link that I have in the chat there, magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM. And uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do to set your mind free from death anxiety and no longer the need for any free will because it doesn't exist. <laughs> and not only does it not exist, but it just at its face doesn't exist because free will is just a term and terms do not necessarily um, point to anything. Not that they also aren't things in and of themselves, but that's a lot of like chin scratching stuff. And again, I thought of removing it from the book, but I still think it's pretty essential because of the death anxiety that we're going to also help use your memory to remove from your life because death anxiety is, um, is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, so will you or will you not get rid of it? I don't know. But if you really want to focus on the end game, back to end games, what other end game is there worth resolving than death, right? So, <laughs> and the martial arts part of this goes a lot into, even if it doesn't use those words, those battles to the death, even if you're not going to die in a martial arts match, that's what they are symbolizing, right? And it's the fitness to survive the threat of death in many, many ways. Joseph says, <laughs> rabbit hole, red pill stuff. Perhaps I do use the matrix to a fair extent in the, in the um, new book. And again, to call back to our topic today, the art of learning says we should embrace complexity. So in my new book, even though it may uh, risk its future popularity to come, if it is destined to have any, I don't avoid complexity whatsoever. And why would I? Because as Josh points out, you got to separate the real from the mystical. And so a lot of the things that I have studied deeply, unfortunately, are filled with mystical nonsense that we need to cut out, right? And one of the ways that we do that is by separating it out. Just very simple. And when you want to learn, you've got to get rid of the mystical. So a lot of people think, and this goes back to some of the points that we've already covered, a lot of people think, well, you know, uh, uh, other learners are just naturally gifted and so forth. Well, because we know it's not about intelligence, it can't be that. So that's mystical. That's a myth. So what is the real thing? Well, the real thing is, is if you set appropriate goals, then you'll be able to proceed. And if you do so in a way that is frequent, focuses on relevant information, is done in the spirit of experimentation where you let go of the outcome and is absolutely entertaining at every step to your mind, you will free your mind. F-R-E-E, -E, right? Frequent with relevant information in the spirit of experimentation and always entertaining, right? So you've got to make sure that you do that sort of stuff and then it doesn't matter. Um, but you've got to also separate the real from the physical. Hammy is in the house, 72. Trust in the one who has conquered death. Jesus Christ, that's being well prepared. Hmm, I'm not sure I agree, but thank you for sharing that. And I would be interested in uh, what evidence you have to support the claim that uh, 
this is the case. But I get you in, I get you in uh, symbolic uh, senses, to be sure. Joseph said, that's why higher thinking order is important. Higher order thinking is indeed important, Joseph. And people can prepare themselves for higher order thinking by being willing to separate the real from the mystical. And so to go back to Hammy's uh, comment there, what would we what would we do to separate the real from the mystical? Well, there's lots to do. It's not in uh, it's not on topic today necessarily, but if you wanted to learn a lot about that, you might for example learn Aramaic and Greek. You might also learn a bit of Hebrew. And so rather than um, tossing out those sorts of things, you might spend some time thinking about about what those languages said in the record and then understand the record think about you know how those texts were recorded how they were transmitted think about the role of adaptation polinian uh, adaptation for example would be very very useful in in that conversation which uh we don't necessarily need to get into right now but um <laughs> it's absolutely essential uh very very important so thank you for uh, all these comments. And uh, indeed, Joseph, you're right. We need to get higher order thinking. Shane is in the house. Good to see you, Shane. What do you think about dual task working memory training? Well, please let me know more about what you mean about dual task working memory training. If you uh, know my work, I'm not always that, that um, concerned about what working memory means. Uh, and there's reasons for that we see all the time in the memory competitions that uh, we don't we don't necessarily uh, have nearly as clear an understanding of working memory as we might think. And you may want to look more at some of the studies uh, that have been done on uh, on the brains of memory competitors and so forth and see what that uh, says to you about your own question. But I'd like to know what you mean by dual task, and I would love to know what you mean by working memory because we want to make sure that what we're talking about is the right terminology. So if you would uh, please supply uh, some definitions of those two terms, that would be wonderful and much appreciated. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and, and feel free to uh, supply your own definitions of working memory and dual task as well to keep that conversation rolling if you are interested. Palav is here with a number five. Excellent, Palavs. Good to see you. Lunge is here. Hey, folks. Hey, Lunge. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Palav says, which five books changed your life? Evolving Beyond Thought by Gary Weber. Happiness Beyond Thought by Gary Weber. The Republic by Plato. Oh, man. I, do I have to have only five? Uh, <laughs> let's see here. What else comes to mind? A question... Of Memory by David Burglass. Um, five. Uh, what else changed my life? So many books changed my life. The um, uh, Rhetorica Ad Herenium. Uh, let's see. Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas. Uh, City of God by St. Augustine. Hmm. Uh, something called Paratext. Uh, sorry, uh, Pataphysics by Christian Book, Paratex by Gerard Genet. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I think it's an article called Structure, Sign, and Play in the Human Discourses, and so on and so on. I mean, I, I can go on and on. There, actually, Palav, I, I would try and, uh, try and get a, a question that's a little bit more targeted rather than which five books have changed your life. Change life to some specific thing, right? So like memory or uh, business or whatever, right? I mean, we can go all over the place. So Maricela says, hi, guys, busy, but like to say a message to protect my privacy. Privacy. Uh, okay, I'm not sure what you mean, Maricela, but please uh, do protect your privacy uh, to whatever way that you feel you need to do. Um, and please, uh, please do that. Uh, or, you know, use our Facebook group if uh, if you want to really protect it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure that privacy exists anymore, uh, but thank you for your post here. Chubbs is here. Good to see you, Chubbs Arts. You say, hello, this video is amazing, and you say you've got to be the smartest person ever. I don't think that's true, and uh, please avoid 
uh, statements like that because there are people you might say that to who w would take that to heart and it would bolster their ego. Uh, there is an old saying that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I don't think that's the case now. And it's very rare that I think that would ever be the case. Uh, but thank you for the kind words anyway. And I, I, I do hope that this video at least approaches amazing. And it's all the more amazing when people show up and get involved in the discussion. So if you're here, hit that thumbs up and let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And Oliver is here, says, hello, Anthony, always great to catch a live stream. Awesome, awesome. Love it. <laughs> Chubb Arts says, wow, just take the damn comment. Listen, Chubb Arts, I will take whatever I like and uh, deny whatever I like. And when you really begin to become, uh, you know, a discerning individual, you might do the same. But I just don't take compliments that are meaningless. Sorry. Uh, but sorry is my Canadian affectation. But I really, uh, I really am not going to take the damn comment, especially when damn is spelt in that manner. <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, uh, I really appreciate you, though, one way or the other. And I wonder if you've started to notice that uh, compliments are really useless. Uh, we, don't, we don't need compliments in, in today's world. And part of what we've been talking about today has been precisely the detachment from praise and criticism so that we can analyze what's really going on in the world. And so, if you want to go back and watch the replay, you may understand why that um, I'm not going to take the damn comment. Uh, compliments are a dangerous thing. All right. So, Reclaiming Life says, the mystical and the mythical are both great to learn about and from, especially when it comes to developing a better understanding of others. I should reread Joseph Campbell. Yeah, he might be an interesting cat to reread indeed. Uh, I was always a bit nonplussed. When, when I did read him, although I think that many people have extracted wonderful things from it, but um, I, I made myself need to re-read it. There's uh, so many wonderful things to read, and uh, I don't know, have you, have you read this before? Um, I think it's kind of a, a really cool text to uh, check out. All right, so let's uh, carry on here. We've got to separate the real from the physical, and... Um, one of the things that we'll want to also do as we do so is be rooted, hold ground and direct force. So for example, this is um, something like what we just did when we got this, uh, this compliment and pushback <laughs> is we just hold ground and direct force. Mr. Artis says, this sucks. Well, that's uh, great. Thank you for your feedback. Really appreciate you being here. And um, all right. Mr. Uh, artist is very artistic with his comments today. Thank you for being here and uh, practicing your artistry. Very, very interesting. So. Forgive that uh, <laughs> little little blip, but uh, Mr. Artist was not nearly as artistic as I was hoping. All right. Reclaiming Life says, no, I haven't, but just ordered it during the live stream. Excellent. Love to know your thoughts when you get it. And yeah, I'll think about rereading Campbell. Um, I think of rereading Young as well recently a lot, which uh, obviously would be instructive. Palav is in the house. Good to see you, Palav. Wonderful to have you here. Oh, you were here already, weren't you? Yes, uh, I think so. Um, how to learn mind map. Please, uh, please go to magneticmerrymethod.com. There's a search button. Pump in mind map. You'll find a number of resources. And also on this channel, you can search my channel to look at mind mapping. And we recently did a three-part series on mind mapping. But I think uh, if you look at it on the site, much, much better. All right. Saludos from Mexico. This topic sounds interesting. Oscar, good to have you here. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Hola. <laughs> Como estas? Um, wonderful, wonderful. So I hope that helps you. Palav, we're not going to really get into mind mapping. My mind map thing is back there. I don't want to uh, go and get it. But I've been mind mapping so much lately. And a huge, uh, a huge part of mind mapping is what we always talk about. Practice it 
frequently. Study as much as you can as you continue to practice. And uh, as you continue to practice, well, make sure that you plunge into an initially small pool of information about it. So one of the things that you might be tempted to do is read 5,000 books on mind mapping, but you could just read one. Mind Map Mastery would be the one that I recommend. Um, but this quote, plunge into an initially small pool of information is in the art of learning. And it's um, it can be very difficult. It can be very challenging, but you want to do that. And like, for example, with card magic, one of the one of the things that separates people so quickly is the ones who just wind up collecting oodles and oodles of tricks as opposed to the one who just says i am going to master this one technique this one trick whatever it is this one routine and they just focus on it so and it's hard it's hard it's hard for me as well um you know you get started with the mem deck routine and the next thing you know you know, you oh, well, now I want to go and study this guy, and I want to go study that guy, and oh, blah, 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 blah. Like, there's a zillion things out there, but you've got to focus. And so what would be an example of plunging into an initially small pool of information? One book on one technique, and then just stay with it, stick with it. In memory training, pick one person, one teacher, stick with it, 90 days minimum, just go all the way through. Then you can add more. You can add all the more that you want, but that same principle stick with the one person and follow through for at least 90 days so reclaiming life says i've been considering rereading young as well but this time in german to see how much was lost or altered in translations yeah um there certainly would be more altered than lost i would imagine but who knows right uh if you can read them in german yeah, yeah it's it's worthy i've been reading a bit of Nietzsche lately, Auf Deutsch, and also listening to some audiobooks in German, and yeah, German's great. It, 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 it's not so much that um, things are altered, but that they must be altered because they're just, they're not translatable. So I've also been reading a little bit, rereading um, Heidegger, and you know, there's just so many terms that even in the English translation just don't work. Uh, they just don't work in English. They don't make sense. But they make a lot of sense in German uh, in terms of what he's trying to say. And it's very important in Heidegger himself because of his take on technology and so forth. All right. So Chubb says, I'm only 12 and have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> well, Chubbs, <laughs> I'm glad that you, you have so much initiative at this level but I don't know why you're hanging around in a place where you have no idea what you're saying. Um, so you may want to, uh, uh, I don't know, enjoy. <laughs> uh, but this is not really um, designed for uh, people who are of any age under than adulthood. All right. So Joseph says, think slow, think fast. Um, yeah, are you thinking of the Kahneman book? Uh, very good for learning some of your your um, cognitive biases and other things. So, yes, indeed. Maricela says, clarification. There is a message that appears in the Facebook that says, protect your privacy. I do not know if you put that in Facebook. Normally I wrote, talk about everything. I do not control Facebook, Maricela, so I didn't put that there. But generally, just um, just allow yourself to use your your best discernment about what you type into anything right um i think a lot of people have a fantasy that what they do online is not being tracked or whatever everybody's being tracked <laughs> everybody so you know whatever you do just only share the things that you would like to share and don't share the things that you wouldn't like to share but be aware that you are sharing 24 7 all kinds of things that you wouldn't like to share if you didn't and so just live a life that is a uh, spotless period. All right, so back to our topic here, the art of learning, we wanna plunge into an initially small pool of information. This is very, very important, no matter who you are, whatever it is you wanna do, focus. So in language learning, instead of getting 50,000 websites together, 800 million podcasts together, etc., get one episode, one book, one video program, and just focus on those things. Stick with just a fewer amount of things, you'll get a lot further, farther, faster. All right. Now, one thing that I think is really, really important to understand 
And this is not a, a tip. This final tip is not a tip that's in this book. But it's one thing that I think is being said here, is that theory is really, really important. But there is no such thing as theory unless it's in action. So music theory, for example, is something that is understood conceptually, conceivably, and so forth. But it's not really a theory until that it's in action. So until you can play quarter notes, uh, you know, you, your theory of quarter notes is a bit lost. Until you're actually writing and thinking how that it fits into whatever modes or keys or however you're, whatever it is you're studying in theory, it's, it's not really there. You've got to put it into action. Memory techniques, there's a lot of theory, but it's not really theory until you put it into action. And the fact that your understanding requires meta-level skills always means that you haven't understood memory techniques until two things have happened. One, you've put the theory into action. Two, you've taught it to somebody else. And that's when you really understand theory. This is just a fact of the techniques. And people can readily put the theory into action by not overthinking it, just following the steps, and enabling themselves to then monitor what has been done and then explain it to other people. Even if you just explain it to yourself, that's halfway there to explaining it to other people because you are another to yourself, right? Um, and people can really, really learn it thoroughly when they follow that approach. And they just understand that it's not even theory until it's in action. So that's uh, been my overview of The Art of Learning, which I highly recommend. Please get it. Please read it. Please enjoy it and um, allow yourself the benefit of learning how to learn better by continually learning how to learn. Don't stop and keep going forward. Again, I want to thank everybody who supported this, uh, this uh, podcast episode with Braden Adams. Absolutely incredible that we got so many shares. We've broken a record. A memory competitor has helped us bro break a share record. And as I said today, you don't want to get caught up in the results, but you don't want to pretend that they don't matter either, which is a great lesson from the art of learning. So I'm really happy. If you haven't had a listen yet, please follow the link that I'm putting in the chat for you now and share it around so that we can continue helping you. And uh, very, very, very grateful for that. And then, of course, the new book is well on its way into your preferred consumption thing. I've got the audiobook studio booked for next month. Very, very excited about that. Proper studio. It is going to be a long time in that studio. <laughs> so that's going to be exciting. New territory for me. And I will be sharing some of the back, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Behind the scenes material uh, for the... Um, for this process with the uh, with the behind the scenes uh, of all of this going on. And it's very, very, uh, very interesting how that that's all going to play. So if you want to see in the studio, etc., make sure you're part of the part of the um, part of the street team. Uh, so, Joseph, your your recent comment there was blocked and it's probably because of the language that you used. So. What I would um, suggest is email me. I have a resource to answer your question. And uh, thank you for being, you know, for having no shame. You shouldn't have shame around that. But I understand why the robots block that. Uh, and just uh, to keep this channel on the safe side, I'm not going to, uh, to show that chat. But there is a, uh, there's a resource for you that is on my site that you can go through. And it'll help you uh, understand that. Uh, to the best of my ability. And at the end of the day, it's, um, it's something that if you want to solve it, you can solve it. And I have, I have uh, dedicated, detailed, laser-targeted help for you in the form of a resource. And you, um, you can deal with it if you want to change. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So thank you for your courage. Uh, even, if you, even if you feel no shame in it, it does take courage to... Uh, to be open about those kinds of things. And so just reach out by email or even search my site and it should come up for you. All right, everybody. So the um, 
next book carries on. It's It's been tons and tons of work, and there's still lots and lots of steps to go. And of course, I've had it a lot on my mind. Isn't it nice to know that you can move through, push through any difficulties that you face out there, no matter what it is, and... Um, you know, you know, there's just there's always a there's all always a solution. People are able to find the way if they dedicate themselves to studying the art of learning. And a person doesn't have to get held back. You don't have to, you know, be constantly falling behind or having anything less than what you want. You just have to start by imagining yourself making a difference, practicing differently and using some of the tips that we talked about today. So I hope that this presentation helps you. And if you need to go back and watch the replay, please do. If you haven't hit the thumbs up yet, hit that thumbs up and uh, go as Reclaiming Life did, order yourself a copy of The Art of Learning. It's a very quick read. You can read it in an afternoon, maybe two afternoons and enable yourself to come back and watch this, see the tips that I pulled out of it and understand that theory isn't even theory until you put it into action and put it into action. And if you need help with memory palaces, then you can always get the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. And if you want to be part of the street team of my next book, that will help you even further. One of the things you're really going to love about the next book is how that it goes to the best of my ability into memory techniques and memory palaces in more detail than I've seen anywhere else. And you can already see some of the main memory palace illustration at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM. And again, that link is there for you in the chat. And I look forward to hearing from you all again very soon. Thank you again for being here today. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.